Welcome to our second last panel. Um, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so my, na my name is Arnaud Demange. I'm a student on the MSc in African Studies, and I had the honor of being the head of program of the Oxford Africa Conference this year. And I've got the pleasure to supervise the session on uh, energy in Africa doing business differently and to introduce our moderator to you. So our moderator today is uh, Ujo Soon, also known as Jolly. She's a DPS student and was previously on the MSc of African Studies. Um, she, her research has focused on China-Zambia relationship in the mining industry and uh, on corporate social responsibility. And she also worked for the International Department of the China Development Bank uh, on energy-related topics. Uh, and she was on the other side of the mirror two years ago as uh, a co committee member of the Oxford Africa Conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the short introduction. Uh, I'm today's moderator. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to sit in the panel, and we have very um, distinguished guests. And firstly, we have Mr. Mamadou Touri, who is a founder and chairman of Africa 2.1 Foundation, which is an initiative-driven advocacy group that brings together emerging leaders representing African countries and diaspora, who share a common vision of the continent's future. He is also the chairman and CEO of Ubendu Capital, a leading investment and advisory firm focused on designing and implementing integral, innovative investment solutions uplifting projects, ecosystems. And secondly, we have um, Tamila Abimbola, who is um, the lead advisor to the FVP COO of the African Development Bank. And prior to joining the bank, she was also an associate professor at Warwick Business School, University of Warwick, England. And she holds a PhD in Management and Business Administration from Aston University, UK. And she's also a very, in, uh, very active researcher, teacher, and consultant. And finally, we have Professor Stephen Durkin from uh, the Blavanik School of Governance, and who is also a chief economist at DFEED as director of the Center for the Study of African Economics uh, at Oxford. So uh, we're very proud to uh, open our discussion today because our time is really s short. So we rather like this panel to be really interactive. So we'll give um, like around like five minutes to each speaker to start with, and then we'll move on um, to the question and answer session. But before we start, uh, I would like to first introduce a bit about today's panel is about energy in Africa. It's a very, very big theme. So we think of the theme, we'll probably know a lot of data. For example, like the continent itself accounts for 13% of the world's population, but only 4% of its energy demand. And the energy demand itself grew by 45% from 2000 to 2012. And more than 620 million people are without access to electricity. And nearly 730 million people rely on traditional use of solid biomass for cooking. So by illustrating those data, uh, we want to show that actually Africa itself is really rich in energy resources, but in fact, very poor in energy supply. Because if we think of the energy resources in Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, we have sufficient oil for around 100 years, and coal for more than 400 years, and gas for more than 600 years. So probably the first question for the panel list to address is like, why did African energy production capacity not keep pace with the increase in population and economic growth? And then secondly, what is the African potential in terms of energy production and how it can be harnessed? So. With the start, we would like to first introduce Mr. Mamadou to start uh, addressing those questions from your own working experience. Let's welcome. Thank you. Um, 
think I'll just hold this one. Yes, you know, to your question about uh, why didn't African countries keep pace with the demand, um, I think there are a few reasons that are first linked to poor planning, right? So uh, technically, you um, you anticipate 20-year demand and you start building the capacity now uh, in um, in the power sector. At least if you look at it from the ancient model where it was generally centralized by uh, utilities. The second, uh, second issue was poor management of those utilities. So uh, most uh, African utilities are in quasi-bankrupt situation um, that have been linked to you know, diverse factors from poor maintenance to you know, uh, lack of rigor or lack of governance. Um, the, the third factor is purely economic, right? So, uh, you know, you, you'll probably remember that uh, uh, after the, you know, the, the glorious years in the 70s, uh, in the 80s, most African countries entered into some form of recession, uh, facing major, major financial challenges and being uh, locked by the structural adjustment plans, um, you know, uh, pro promoted by the World Bank and IMF that significantly reduced or killed um, their budget expansions um, in terms of, uh, um, you know, not only debt, but uh, uh, additional investments. So um, now think, go back 25 years down the road and you're in the middle of an adjustment plan and for 10 years you can't invest in infrastructure. What happens 25 years later when you know it's a 20 year plan and game to, to actually anticipate demand? Then you reach in 2015 and you have no power, right? So that's, that's uh, obviously another key element. I think um, the other one that is critical is also um, um, important to, 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 to sense what challenges uh, we're facing today and what consequences it has, right? So if you think about anticipating demand, now in 2050, there will be two billion Africans. Um, the consequence of that is for a country like Nigeria, for instance, they need something around 25 gigawatts within the next 10 years, and they're adding a max of 500 every five years. So um, you can't technically match the demand if you follow the old model. So you, you will need to think disruptive, the same way as uh, mobile telecommunications enabled Africa to leapfrog and catch up with the rest of the world from a, from a mobile penetration point of view. So what happened then, late 90s, early 2000s? Um, you know, new technology came in, new regulatory framework also allowing private sector to take a much bigger role into the provision of electricity, uh, of uh, mobile telecommunications, which technically allowed to leapfrog, and as such, <laughs> you, do, you did have key players who came in because it would take, at the time, you know, 100 years to kind of wire a country like Cameroon or any other country with those copper wires to have fixed line. Mobile enable to leapfrog, right, and to technically have access to uh, a mobile phone plug and play. I think what we, the era we're entering into now um, is, is going to be something very similar in energy. Uh, I think uh, you can't really rely just on government to match the demand. And if it's a question of demand, then you're going to have to play the law of offer and demand in a market way. And in that sense, um, what, you're seeing, what you've seen happening over the past 15 years, 15, 20 years, was IPPs, right? Independent power producers that were, you know, most African governments will call from international investors to actually help match that demand. But now let's think, what if you just serve directly the demand, which is through mobile, wind, and battery kits, basically, that you can compare to a phone, because actually today they cost about the same price, of half the price actually of an iPhone, um, and for people to actually go and acquire those equipment. Now the demand will be served by itself and will obviously grow. Und undoubtedly, you still need high base load energy, right, which is big power plants, etc. Um, 
to the second question to answer quickly actually the end of my answer to the first question and to the second one which is i don't think our greatest resource today for energy would be coal because no one wants to fund coal today or or oil um, um maybe gas to a certain extent but our greatest resource are actually the sun and the wind if we work it out nicely point is the price of solar have been divided by half, the same way as at the time in the 90s, the, um, the price of mobile phones was reduced by 80%, which allowed now people to go and get phones. Mm -hmm. So we can anticipate this kind of offer and demand match through a disruptive approach that will be led by the demand going directly to get what they want. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start from the perspective of five minutes that you uh, have said, since we are going to uh, make sure it is audience participation. I want to set the scene by looking at the key question you posed to, to us. Um, what should we do differently? I'm very sure uh, within the audience you have the uh, brain power for all of you to come up with so many different ways through your questions that Africa should be doing it. I also want to remind you uh, that we have different set of contexts. We have the global context. It is impossible for Africa to separate itself from the uh, global context. We also have the Africa-based context and it is very difficult and it is challenging for Africa to exclude itself from its own context. After all, it doesn't matter how much you are externally focused, what get done on the ground is what you are going to have as your gain from any uh, changes in the way you, you approach energy. There is no doubt in saying Africa do need to ramp up is light up to, 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 to energize, quote unquote. You only need to fly over certain countries. If you fly at night, Remember this, look down on many of our major cities and you see how dark it is. And look down on many of, you know, say I'm flying from Abidjan to Paris, I could see the way the whole place lit up. So you don't really need too much statistics. It's very dire. You can also, if you want to do so, uh, uh, compare the whole supply of energy in Africa to just one country in Eastern European countries or Spain. The whole of Africa is lit up exactly the same size as a single country, Spain. So if you want, you, you can go on that statistics. But some of the facts on the ground are these. We have a lot of institutional challenges within the continent. We have a, the resulting lack of energy and the consequences of the rural deprivation, which explains why many people are migrating to the cities because uh, if you look at uh, the rate, you, the question we ask is why are these getting worse? Urbanization is also growing larger, but in the context of Africa, it is ghettoization of urban space. That is where we have most, a large number of ghettos in Lagos. I was traveling on Sunday, last week Sunday, from Lagos, about the expressway to, to um, from Lagos to about the expressway, which uh, my new senior vice president, uh, friend Elitia, took a picture of around six, seven years ago. It is dire. Within 10 years, they've ghettoized almost 50 miles outside Lagos, and the same is repeated across uh, many African countries, Nairobi, uh, you get the same thing, and so many, Dar, and many big cities, ghettoization. What we have to look at the consequences of lack of energy, therefore, we cannot industrialize. Industrial production or industrial capability of Africa is lower now than it was when Adeniji, Adeniji, uh, Professor Adeniji, Adeniji was writing about industrializing Africa. The primary point behind that is lack of energy. You cannot do anything without it. 
some of the challenges we have in human deprivation is also as a result of that. Many people have housemaids, uh, so on and so forth, because some of the basic value adding process that will have been in place for you to live a comfortable life without somebody else helping you is not there. Some of the things we do with agricultural uh, outcomes, you know, how many of them get perished is also lack of industrialization again, and the, the list is endless. So we can then look at where we are now. We just left the MDG last year. We have three major international framework that came out last year. One is the SDG, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, Finance for Development, billion to trillion, as well as COP21 in, in Paris in December. All those three means we have do, to do things differently from the outside perspective, more uh, uh, issues within those uh, financing, and how do we manage the different process of uh, gaining energy, and the context in Africa. With that in mind, uh, we suggest you bear it and then challenge us with your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stephen? Right. Um, well, let me add a few things, and let, let me try to be a bit more controversial. Um, Okay, so we are, of course, observing, uh, just as two speakers already said, you know, this kind of total lack of underinvestment in energy in the last few decades in Africa. I mean, it is, it is indeed one of the main constraints on reindustrializing Africa to actually pick up again, getting investment in and do things. You know, there's not a single country I travel to where that's not a main issue. So. Where does this come from? Well, it's fundamentally, there's been, you know, investment has to do with long-term horizons. And um, however one may be tempted to try to blame what happened in the 1980s with structural adjustment and whatever, I mean, for me, it's fundamentally an absolute failure of politics in Africa. It's a fundamental failure of actually wanting to plan for the long run. Whether you go to South Africa, whether you go to Nigeria, whether you go to Tanzania, DRC, all countries I've recently been to, where are you actually facing a fundamental underinvestment? Now, in all these cases, one could have seen that this was coming, and there's no, no outsider to blame for it, but if, if actually this is not a sector where you can easily capture rents in the, uh, because these are pretty long-term investments. There's lots more things you can capture rents for in the short run. I think there's an awful lot to do there, what's been happening. I think it's changing. I'm actually quite encouraged that there is a willingness, even in political leadership, to actually say, look, these are things. Yes, these are difficult things to get the deals together, to get it properly organized, because these are things that you can't really do by just saying, oh, the state will just do it and will keep control of the whole thing. They will have to involve regional cooperation because energy is a tradable good. It's, uh, it's only if there's regional cooperation that actually the big energy projects will really be off the ground. Think of what's happening in Ethiopia. They will rely on selling it abroad to actually get a foreign exchange to do certain things within their country. It, it's also in, in other parts of the region. It also is to do with bringing the private sector in. You do need, with independent power producers, you need to get really stable long-term horizons and really complicated deals that you need to strike. So I think it's happening. That there is a changing energy environment that is possible, but I still worry about it that the investment climate underlying it is still pretty fragile and that we are not going to get necessarily easily the deals in a lot of places. I can see it in some countries. I think there's going to be other countries when very little will happen in the next decade, and it will be even worse then. And so then the third point I want to make is that there are more opportunities, and I think it's been alluded to already. There are more opportunities because renewables provide an alternative opportunity beyond the coal and oil where it had to be. Um, but let's not overstate it, okay? I come from an organization where at times it feels, working in London in DFID, where at times we may be overstating that everywhere and anywhere it will be renewables that will give you the answer. No, there are great, I've been visiting great solar farms in Africa, they can do amazing things, it is there. The cost is lower in many places, but there's still a few buts around here as well. It's not everywhere in every locality that that's going to be the solution. And if you think that a solar panel is going to create industry, no, it isn't. You know, the kind of grid-based, even if it's 
whatever when people talk about mini grids, mini will still have to be big and bigger than most minis that people are referring to. Because we do need massive uh, so, so supply of energy. It's one thing to get a solar panel to get a child to read a book with. It's another thing to actually get a mill operated. You need quite a lot of stuff for that sense. And then finally, hydro isn't being mentioned. I do still think that's the big future for several countries in Africa, including as an export thing. Dams and hydro, it's there. It's interesting to see what's going on in Ethiopia. It's interesting to see what's not quite going on in DRC, but my God, let's hope at some point we can get it get, get going there. But the main thing there I would say, and that's the organization that I work with, please, please, yes, these things have impacts on the environment and they may have social impacts. But let's not forget that we killed off hydro. There's not a single international organization that is Washington-based, or there's one very particular one, that can actually touch hydro anymore because NGOs will basically make it impossible to even try to think about it. There's not a single uh, World Bank-related lending going on related to any of the dams in Ethiopia. They can invest in transmission, but they can't invest in any of the dams. So let's be very careful. Yes, there are things that need to look at. I'm not trying to advocate zero, uh, the, the zero attention to environmental social thing. But if we create an environment where a whole series of actually the most green energy in Africa, we can't really invest in it properly because it takes ages and ages and years and years and years to get over that, then we're not going to get very far. Thank you. Thank you for all the speakers. Um, you all touched upon really interesting points. Um, but basically, I think one of the emerging kind of question is like, is our current development toolkit really working um, in terms of solving those problems? And then possibly other question to address is, as the professor said about the relationship uh, between um, the international institutes and the local communities, and sometimes really time consuming to get those deals done. But on the other hand, you have to take consideration of the, uh, the local impacts. This is something really challenging and sometimes would lead to conflicts uh, in, in different sense. And the other things we haven't talked about possibly is probably we think further um, in terms of the technology uh, transfer, uh, because we're not only looking at those um, OECD countries and um, the Western-led in institutes, but also there are a lot of emerging powers uh, in Africa, like China, India, Brazil, who are helping those countries to build a lot of sustainable uh, power stations. But also the other question to talk about possibly is about like gender equality and access to energy uh, in families. I think um, it's probably better now to open the, um, the stage to the audience uh, who would like to raise like questions. To, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, and you can answer your, uh, the questions related to that. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. The volunteers will give the microphone to you. Like this lady. Do we have like three questions in the row if we have other hands? Like this gentleman, another one? Yeah, the lady next to him. Yeah, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Grace from Cambridge. It goes to um, the, 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 the point raised on hydroelectric power. Um, I want to ask the panel, why do you think that um, energy development in Africa has stepped away from hydroelectric electric power? Do you think that perhaps it's because we, it, we want to move forward with solar energy and it, it looks good on paper and it looks good when it's being implemented by the people coming in? And um, h how do you see the prospects of um, African countries collaborating to work with the countries that have the powerful rivers, such as the DRC, to actually power up the whole of the continent? So your perspectives on that. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I do work in rural areas, uh, specifically in Tanzania and Kenya. And there's a trend for expansion of national grids. Um, Kenya's got a big rural ele electrification program. Uh, in the county I'm working in, almost all areas are covered by the grid. Um, the term, which is new to me, and I'd like to hear some views on it from the panel, um, is undergrid as opposed to off-grid. Um, and it's the issue of spatial proximity to the grid, but inability to access it because of cost. Um, 
and how much of that is, is a problem that's being addressed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Kula Kwashi. So my question comes back to the first thing uh, that was stated about the ability to maintain the infrastructures to deliver energy when it begins. A lot of countries in Africa inherited the systems of energy they have from their colonial masters. And one of the things is like, for example, Zimbabwe, we do mainly depend on hydroelectric energy, but one of the things has been maintainability. So the question now comes is how maintainable is it uh, cost-wise for uh, countries and what type of innovations are being done within the, the, the sector of, the, of energy? And I don't mean like how you create the solar energy, but how much innovation is being done to make sure that the maintenance of these energies once they've impl been implemented is cheaper and is affordable. Uh, our panelists will address the questions one by one in case they don't repeat themselves, so. Yeah, you can, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for your questions. I, let's, um, after having listened to my colleagues and to the questions, right, let's put things in perspective. If Africa addresses, you know, its electricity gap, it's 300 basis points, which is 3% GDP growth in addition. So today, if we had fixed electricity, we'd be growing faster than China and India, at least for the top 15 uh, fastest growing economies, right? Another, another important point to your question on maintenance. Only 40% of the installed capacity is actually working. So that's why I told earlier about poor maintenance, right? So you take the case of South Africa, um, 42 gigawatt installed, 21, or 44 installed, 21 operational. And it's technically a country that on paper works, but poor maintenance, right? So if we fix actually what's already broken, we gain roughly 40 to 50 gigawatt. No one is really doing it or no one has the funds to do it. Even if you have the political will, money speaks, money talks, right? Another important point on, um, on the question of hydro, why isn't it more or why isn't there more? It's not just hydro, it's everything else that is baseload. I agree with you, it's essential. And I will say it's the hardest thing to do in Africa today. Why? Again, let's put things in perspective. To do an IPP, so unless you're like Ethiopia where everything is centralized and where the government drives and get potentially Chinese money to make it happen, yeah? Now, assuming you want to do an IPP, what does it take? And it's important that you understand this. For an IPP to happen, you need a PPA, Power Purchase Agreement, with an off-taker that is, in general, the utility or distribu electricity distribution companies. Like I said earlier, 80 to 90% of them are quasi-bankrupt or don't have the funds to pay. So what happens then? You go, more, some of them are semi-privatized, so the three, four countries that actually work from an IPP point of view, quote-unquote, without a government guarantee, would be Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon to a certain extent. South Africa is a bit of a special case, right? Uh, but government still provides guarantee, but government has a bit, a bit better means. So utilities not being able to pay. Most distribution companies in early stage, so don't really have a long-term balance sheet to back on. So who do you go to as a, as a lender to those who want to do those IPPs? Because most of them are done into project finance, yeah? So government will need some form of guarantee so that the lenders can actually fund this IPP and those operators to, because you're not sure they'll take care of their utility will pay. Now, as a government today, right, if I give you a government guarantee, not only I give you a government guarantee, but if it's gas or, or diesel, that's why hydro, like you said, is good, because you don't have that, the entrant to pay, right? But if I have to pay for the gas, let's say if it's a gigawatt or even a 100 mega, megawatt, right, then you have a gas bill of 100 million per year, right? So I have to cover your gas because most of the time they want a gas pass through. And then I have to guarantee you if um, the utility or the distributor, assuming it's not government, decides not to pay. So the burden, right, on my balance sheet as a government is huge, is tremendous, yeah? And guess what? Because I'm giving you a guarantee, I have obligations to the IMF from an accounting point of view. And my balance sheet gets also affected. 
Yeah? So I can't necessarily do everything I want. So those who've managed are the ones who've been indeed good from a political will in structuring the sector in a smart way. But it's not like you wake up a morning and structure it like that, right? You need some good fundamentals to do it, right? And so political is good if once you actually also have what it takes to do it, you have the, the human capital to do it, and you do have the size of a market to do it, which is not always the case. So even if I want to do hydro, I want to do coal, anything like that, my hands are tied. Yeah, so what we're saying about renewables, hydro is probably the cheapest, at least from a OPEX point of view. It has the highest capex, but afterwards, you know, water is free technically. Now you still need gas and diesel if you don't have gas, right? As a, as a backup because you have droughts, right? So you have droughts, so, but all that is a huge investment. So unless there's a consensus, right? Between DFID, World Bank, IMF, China, whomever, like it's happening actually today with Power Africa and everything, where either we change the way we account for government guarantee on infra, or where there's a big support to back that industry, because the only frontier of growth for the next 40 years is going to be Africa. So everyone has to win for it to work. Yeah? So in this case, what do you do in the meantime, right? Take the case of Nigeria. Actually, the, the second one after 15 years, IPP that just closed was Azura. The previous one was 14 years ago, and I worked on it. It was AS Nigeria Bar. So in 12 years, no IPPs. This is a problem when you have 20 gigawatt back up, a backload um, um, <clears throat> um, delay, if you will, right? So that's why we're talking about distributed power and captive power. How do you make it work? Yes, solar for individuals, but for corporates, what are they doing now? They have their own form of kit. So it could be, you know, gas, you know, small, five, ten, etc. So you're kind of going, whether you want it or not, to a market driven power access. Because it's it's it there's a deadlock <laughs> at government level that is gonna take a while and it's gonna take huge commitment from the international community and African states to actually make it work. So captive power, distributed power, where small units, flexible, movable, where the gas can move, right, can actually um, happen. Now, from a technology point of view, it takes time, right? It took 15 years for, to get the price of solar cut by half, right? Now it's accelerating, yes, but it's still, you know, the one thing you can't predict is technology, right? So in the meantime, you have intermediary solutions. So the main target today is, for instance, get more leasing models in Africa right, where you can lease, you know, power equipment, where you can get more the, the, the legal framework and the regulatory framework around power more flexible as long as you keep the environmental. Yes, on the question on the environment, as you said, it's killed us, right? And let me tell you why it's killed us. We didn't build our economies on coal. We're the, probably the cleanest continent, yet we get stuck, and that's a problem. That's all I have to say. <laughs> it is quite uh, it is uh, challenging to look at what is ahead of Africa in terms of power production. I think the point of financing for development is also very inherent in, in the response to how do we finance the energy in Africa. It can no longer be the government. If you wait for the government, we will not have it. And the government are aware of it. We are not the only one. Africa is not the only one. Having said that, the government is responsible for creating the enabling environment, and the enabling environment include regulatory environment. It also includes making sure the way we do business or ease of doing business. Why? Power sector, as Nigeria find out to its cost, is one of the most complicated sectors you can ever imagine. Complicated not in terms of difficult to do, but the value chain of suppliers, producers, enablers, and quality assurance, and all the capacity building that enables it to roll out from the beginning to the end users is very complicated in a context of where we 
are coming from in Africa. Where we are coming from simply means they were monopoly. We were a little bit more monopoly in the way we do it. Um, it's the same in the UK. Utilities was only done by one company. Telephone was what by one company until the regulatory environment that was opened up uh, roughly around 1980s. We cannot ignore that the challenges that poses for us. So you cannot just throw money at it. Nigeria threw a lot of money at it. And when people don't know what to do, that tends to negate what the output you get. Because what you, if garbage goes in, garbage comes out at the end of it. That's the one point about the need for us to know that the value chain must be addressed. We can begin to talk megawatt, we're gonna produce megawatt X amount in many years, but if we do not manage the value environment to say we are deliberately capacitating those things that will make it possible to do along the line, we will end up to a, a typical situation. Now, flip it back to Ivory Coast. I arrived in Cote d'Ivoire in 2014, I wasn't just pleasantly surprised because it simply confirmed a very relatively small size compared to Nigeria. And again, like you rightly pointed out, Mamadou, South Africa is a special example, but they are also facing their challenges. But where they are coming from is different from where most uh, African countries are coming from. But Ivory Coast, they do not have what Nigeria yeah. I think I have to. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely, it is beeping on. They do not have the marmot uh, um, resources that Nigeria do have. But they face the challenges from, from that perspective, managing the value chain, who, get the supply, who are the suppliers, what are the supply chain, and the production of it. And in managing that um, effectively, despite the fact that they've gone through wars and uh, uh, civil strives, really testify to the need to involve the private sector. To, um, to, to, to approach the social impact situation. For example, the rural example in Tanzania, social impacts will have been some, some of the areas uh, that will be of use to, to making that effective in many African countries. When we talk about what form of energy, hydro, hybrid, coal, let me be honest with you, and I'm being very honest here, Africa is not a continent where you can dictate one. It is not possible. South Africa rely more on coal than anything else. So you cannot say, yeah, it is hydro, it is, no, 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 it's not possible. It's not possible. If you, otherwise, you are neglecting the context and we will still be where we are in 30 years time if we are imposing. Besides, that's the point about telling you COP21. COP21 recognize the importance of taking local condition so that whatever your situation, we will not have China. And if the, nobody can impose anything on China, why should that be the case in Africa? No. What we are saying is whatever you have, do it to the betterment of your populace and the environment. And there is technology to make sure that those things can be done. But if we have been dictatorial in saying, well, because certain people have moved to certain extent and we should be there, we will never start. It's like saying you want to run without working. It is not possible. It doesn't mean that we will not do those. But in terms of the variety, of course, we started with hydro is most easily available. It's also the most challenging because it displaces a lot of populations because people live along river. So before you can do those things, essential consideration needs to be given. Are you ready to be at the political way? Because those people who ask you to do the hydro, they'll be the ones to come to you when you are displacing a lot of population. And I believe um, one of the speakers earlier mentioned some of the challenges of exclusions uh, um, and displacing people in mega projects. It doesn't mean we will not take them into consideration, but the more we know the value chain and the challenges we have along, including lack of planning, and again, I think, as you rightly mentioned, sir, um, uh, it is a long-term project. Energy projects are long-term projects. Whether it is um, under grid or small size, they are always very um, long-term focus in their approach to, to developing them. Thank you. So why don't you collect some questions? Yeah. Yeah, we'll
So hi, my name is David Kayondal. Um, I'm an advisor at the Grow Movement. Uh, it's, it's a question for the professor regarding, you mentioned the Grand Inga is, is facing some challenges. Um, now, a lot of African projects obviously face huge challenges because of the you know, delays and, and obviously loss of funding through various streams. What lessons from a funding perspective have you learned in, in funding these mega projects? Do you have to take that? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, what, what people are emphasizing also on the panel and saying is, you know, and because it's long term, because it involves various stakeholders that need to be dealt with, and I mean, mean here government, the different parts of government, uh, something to do with local populations, but also bringing in the finance international uh, expertise in doing it. You know, these are complex programs. It's, um, I, I st you know, what I definitely have learned um, on when we're trying to deal with some of these is um, how underlying commitment have to be really strong to try to get it to work. I come too often across, in the end, things get delayed because of vested interests. And, you know, I, in terms of, you know, I've not been involved in Inga, but it's definitely the one that's, that strikes uh, very much a court. The political will in Kinshasa was arguably very limited to really make this work. You know, there was probably they were preoccupied with more easy ways of capturing rents than actually doing a long term energy project. Um, but then even the structure, I definitely think of it, what we're now trying to do is to say actually can the INGA be an export source, an ex a source of export earnings for, for the DRC, you know, it complicates matters again because geopolitics came into it, you know, we, could we have a Chinese one, no, maybe, yes, maybe not, could we have South African firms doing the whole thing and anyway. It all felt, again, a lot of vested interest. And it's even in the... Pr so what I've definitely learned is that those areas where there is... Those, those handful of places where the political incentives one way or another get aligned, that actually it can make it happen, it, it can happen. It's, you know, hydro is a good example. The whole of Sweden was built on hydro, 1,300 different hydro projects with displacement of populations and all the things involved. You can handle that without having your country break out in violent conflict and, uh, and destruction. So just simply that skepta, ooh, we can't do this. There's all kinds of things you can do in development that are tricky and messy, but you can do it. So the final point I want to make is some of the vested interest we see also in the countries we work in. Um, just coming back from Tanzania is again seeing very clearly how some of these deals are virtually impossible. You know, if your energy subsidies are of a level that are fundamentally unsustainable, but also resulting in the, 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 the parastate uh, energy company never being able to pay the bills to the IPPs despite the contracts, no enforceability of any of these contracts, and it's just an absolute mess that is developing at this very moment there. You know, you, you are, but it's fundamentally an issue of, you know, let's get some structures going. This is not about privatizing or not, but just get some sensible competition policies, sensible regulatory frameworks. But my God, let's actually stick to them. There are various models that we can do, but choose one because it's an absolute disaster area on the ground in many of the cases involved. And I think that's, uh, I could say more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's the end of the panel, but I think the conversation will continue. And if you want to uh, ask questions specifically, you can approach the speakers after the session. But now, before that, let's give a round of applause to the very stimulating and sincere answers. Thank you again. Can I ask you to remain seated because we're about to start the closing panel? So thank you. <laughs>